thank you all for coming to the American Academy tonight. Um, it's a great pleasure to have so many of you um, here in this uh, beautiful space. Uh, the Federal Foundation Magnus Hirschfeld is very happy to be part of this event. And of course, I'd like to welcome Robert Beachy as well. Um, what we're going to do is tonight, Mary told you about it, Robert will read some sections from the book. And after that, I will discuss with him some topics from the book. Um, and then um, you can ask your questions directly to Robert. And we're going to finish the evening by a last short reading, and you're invited to have some wine with us after the event. Just to introduce um, the evening, I would like to share with you a personal story, um, the connection between me um, and the book. Um, I started working for the Federal Foundation Magnus Hirschfeld in February 2015, and it was exactly one week um, before I took up my employment that I um, literally happened to read um, a review of Robert's book in The New Yorker by Alex Ross, who was, as um, Kerry Scherer pointed out to me himself, a fellow here at the American Academy one time. And um, as I had been working in a completely different field, um, you've heard that I've dealt with um, witnesses of the Holocaust or of national socialist persecution before, um, I thought that this book could very easily serve as a good introduction to my new work and that I should, it, um, I should read it immediately. And um, so um, to sit here nine months later beside the man uh, is <laughs> kind of a, <clears throat> a, kind of a uh, full circle for me now. And I think it's the end of my introduction to that new work. Um, OK. Um, I can tell you, especially those of you who do not deal with gender studies or with um, history of homosexuality, um, that it's true that the book really is a wonderful introduction into the subject matter. And it's also um, a book that is very informative for the expert because it is very accessible. It is <coughs> summarizing things and at the same time very rich um, in detail. It is written in a very elegant um, Sachbuch Prosa, as we, we talked about the word yesterday, non-fictional prose. And it's not only a history um, of uh, homosexuality in Germany or in Berlin from the 1860s, 1870s to the 1930s, but it's also, of course, um, part of a broader uh, social and cultural history um, of Germany. And it's also, at least that was my reading experience, written um, like a good novel, because Robert introduces um, characters again and again, sometimes very charismatic ones, sometimes rather problematic ones, enigmatic ones, and he talks about them, then he leaves them alone and comes back to them, returns to them some 50 or 100 pages later, uh, like a good and, and a big novel should do. And we are going to hear about one of those characters in the beginning. Robert will now read a section from the beginning of chapter one that deals um, with Karl Heinrich Ulrichs. And it's sort of a, uh, I'd call it sort of a primal scene, not only for the book, but for, for history. And I hand over to you, Robert, now. Thank you so much, Daniel, Mary, for those incredibly generous introductions. And I can't help but blush. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here tonight. And so I'm going to read uh, from the very beginning of the first chapter. And just to um, provide a little more context, I would like to describe um, a little bit of what I think uh, Karl Heinrich Ulrich's significance is in this particular event. He's really responsible for introducing the first um, homosexual rights activism. He's, he's often described as the first um, gay man to out himself. Um, but in addition to a kind of one-man campaign that he launches in the 1860s, he also works very hard to describe what I think he would have felt was a kind of homosexual selfhood. Um, so he, he talks about um, the ways in which uh, being homosexual or um, loving members of the same sex um, is something that is 
almost congenital, maybe hardwired, something that's innate. Um, and along with that, he's also able to describe and I think compel a lot of his readers to believe that there is in fact a community um, of such sexual minorities, even though they're not necessarily physically visible to each other. So I'll, I'll start at the beginning of the first chapter. On a bright Thursday morning in late August, 1867, the German lawyer, Karl Heinrich Wolrichs, a former member of the civil service in the kingdom of Hanover, approached the Odeon Concert Hall in Munich. Since the beginning of the week, the Association of German Jurists had been assembling in this magnificent neoclassical structure to present papers and discuss the legal issues of the day. The professional group included lawyers, officials, bureaucrats, and legal academics from the 39 states and cities of the former German Confederation. Although the jurists' political program would have important consequences for the incipient German state, Ulrich's appearance at the Odeon marked a revolution all its own. He was preparing to address his professional colleagues on an unmentionable subject, same-sex love, and to protest the various German anti-sodomy laws that criminalized it. Ulrichs had celebrated his birthday the day before, and now, at the age of 42, he hoped to deliver a speech for which he arguably had spent most of his adulthood preparing. As a university student, he'd recognized that he was attracted to other men. This sexual peculiarity and rumors of his intimate affairs had forced him to resign the only professional position he had ever held as a government official. Finally, in an act of enormous courage, he disclosed his secret to his closest kin. Raised in a pious Christian family, whose extended members included numerous Lutheran clergy, Ulrich struggled for years with heart and intellect to make sense of his seemingly unacceptable feelings. Were they unnatural? Had he somehow caused them himself through actions of his own? He examined carefully his own motivations and desires. He secured legal and scientific um, publications on the topic. Following the tradition of the great Protestant reformer Martin Luther, Ulrich's countered prevailing beliefs and developed a theory of his own selfhood, though defined in sexual, not spiritual terms, forming the conviction that he must face down an established authority and counter centuries of prejudice. To that end, since 1864, Ulrich's had published pamphlets under a pseudonym, arguing the case that sexual deviance was an endowment of nature and must be respected. But on that morning in August, crossing Munich's imposing Odeon's Platz, framed by government and cultural buildings, Ulrichs felt his heart palpitate, almost audibly, as he neared the Odeon Hall. As he would later recount, an inner voice whispered, there's still time to keep silent. Simply wave your request to speak, and then your heart can stop pounding. But Ulrichs also remembered those comrades who were anticipating his protest. Was I to answer their trust in me with cowardice? And he recalled the desperate acquaintance who had committed suicide to escape criminal prosecution for sodomy and the public humiliation that would have followed. With breast beating, Ulrichs entered the building, mounted the speaker's platform, and began reading his text to more than 500 professional colleagues. Gentlemen, he intoned, my proposal is directed toward a revision of the current penal law to abolish the persecution of an innocent class of persons. It is at the same time, Ulrichs continued, a question of damning a continuing flood of suicides. The victims, he said, were those sexually drawn to members of their own sex. Expressions of outrage and scattered cries of stop began echoing through the chamber. Alarmed by the voluble hostility, Ulrichs offered to surrender the floor, but others in the audience urged him to continue, and he again took heart. This class of persons, he went on to say, suffered legal persecution only because nature has planted in them a sexual nature that is opposite of that which is usual. Raucous shouts now emanated from the audience. Ulrichs heard hooting, catcalls, and cries of crucify from groups on his left and directly in front. On his right stood those who were not prepared for the content of his address and out of curiosity demanded that he finish. But the cacophony overwhelmed Ulrichs and forced him to descend from the podium without finishing his speech, while the assembly chairman attempted to reestablish order. The Association of Jurists refused to press Ulrichs' agenda after the meeting concluded. Hmm. 
Within five years, member states of the new German Empire had adopted a full penal code in which the punitive Prussian law making a crime of sodomy prevailed over the more liberal law codes of the other German states. But standing at the podium in Munich, Ulrichs had started something important with the first public coming out in modern history. The truly remarkable aspect of Ulrichs's brave initiative was the important contribution he made to the redefinition, indeed the invention, of sexuality and homosexuality in 19th century Europe. Traditional medical science explained sodomy as a willful perversion and the product of masturbation or sexual excess. Sodomites were understood to be oversexed predators who had simply grown bored with women. The established science of sexual perversion viewed same-sex erotic activity as that which it seemed to be and nothing more, an isolated genital act. It was possible to imagine, in fact, that almost anyone might succumb to the crime of sodomy, either through seduction or by willful decision, but ultimately as a result of moral weakness. Sexual desire was considered a fluid and malleable drive that might easily be warped and perverted. By 1900, however, a progressive school of German psychiatry had formed around the belief that same-sex attraction might be congenital and somehow an integral feature of a small sexual minority. <coughs> it became possible now to imagine that certain individuals were attracted innately to their own and not the opposite sex. Indeed, German speakers, both self-identified same-sex loving men and medical doctors, invented a new language of sexual orientation and identity that displaced the older understanding of perversion and moral failure. Invented terms such as earning or Uranian, Ulrich's own coinage, or homosexual first entered the German lexicon and later other European languages as well. Ulrich's pamphlet propaganda played a critical role in this development. His theories of an inborn earning sexuality and character coupled with the outspoken activism helped not only to influence the incipient sciences of sexuality but also to mobilize an imagined community of homosexuals. Concretely, Ulrich spearheaded a conceptual revolution that transformed erotic same-sex love from an idea of deviant acts into a full-blown sexual orientation with its own distinct quality and character. I'd now like to read um, a passage from the second chapter, which deals with the enforcement of paragraph 175, which was the anti-sodomy statute. Um, and this was originally um, a law in the Prussian criminal code and then one that was uh, taken over in um, the imperial criminal code as paragraph 175. This law was, of course, almost impossible to enforce, at least um, practically speaking. It really only criminalized specific sexual acts between men. And it didn't address in any way, shape, or form um, what we might describe as um, homosexual sociability. So the police really didn't have the tools um, to prevent different kinds of bars, cafes, establishments that would potentially cater to same-sex loving men uh, from operating their businesses. And uh, for this reason, um, it became an issue um, in terms of actually being able to honor the, the character of or the, the specific um, um, character of the law. And by the middle of the 1880s, um, one specific uh, Prussian um, Berlin police commissioner, Leopold von Merscheid Hullesen, um, determined that it made a lot more sense to actually allow these different sorts of establishments to simply function and operate as long as they maintained certain um, uh, kinds of decorum. Um, this allowed, in turn, um, same-sex loving men and women to begin the process of constituting something like a community. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, read a little bit from uh, this chapter. If we consider Hulesim's approach more carefully, we can begin to appreciate how the Department of Homosexuals, founded by Hulesim in 1885, contributed to the creation of Berlin's community of sexual minorities. Hulesim knew and used the term homosexual, a neologism from 1869, as we've seen, that was just entering German psychiatric literature. 
This suggests that he had some familiarity with the most recent medical literature and that he might have adopted the view that homosexuality was inborn or congenital. In this sense, the Department of Homosexuals actually gave life to a theoretical construct, the theory of the inborn homosexual, by projecting it as a social and cultural identity and allowing it to develop within a network of bars and same-sex entertainments. Hulesim helped further to create this milieu by making it an object of study. He literally gave tours of the city's homosexual night spots and escorted visitors to same-sex costume balls. Berlin came to serve as a kind of laboratory of sexuality, made available for investigation to a range of psychiatrists, sexologists, journalists, and writers. The experience of playwright August Strindberg at the Café National in February 1893 illustrates this brilliantly. Accompanying other friends who had been invited by a Berlin police inspector, presumably Hulesim, Strindberg described his astonishment and disgust, always ref referring to himself in the third person as the author. And I quote now from Strindberg's account. It was the most horrible thing he had ever seen. In order that a better check might be kept on them, the perverts of the capital had been given permission to hold a fancy dress ball. When it opened, Everyone behaved ceremoniously, <laughs> almost as if they were in a madhouse. Men danced with men, mournfully, with deadly seriousness. The one playing the lady's role might have the mustache of a cavalryman. He might be ugly, with coarse, masculine features, and not even a trace of femininity. The police inspector and his guests had seated themselves at a table in the center of one end of the room, close to which all the couples had to pass. The inspector called them by their Christian names and summoned some of the most interesting among them to his table so that the author could study them. Apart from his visceral repulsion, Strindberg's strongest reaction was to the ball's openness and the official surveillance. The police inspector did not even disguise his presence and actually knew and greeted the participants by name. Simply allowing the growth of a homosexual culture contributed to the burgeoning science of sexology. In one path-breaking work, the first of its kind, published in 1891, Berlin psychiatrist Albert Mohl thanked Hulesim for helping him with his urban ethnography and for allowing him to view internal police and trial documents on cases related to paragraph 175. The illustrious Richard von Kraft Ebbing thanked Hulesim for his assistance in the 1893 edition of Psychopathia Sexualis. These examples illustrate a seeming paradox of Hulesim's policies. The self-serving strategy of tolerating bars and other entertainments was intended to enhance surveillance and control. All the while, it raised the profile of Berlin's same-sex milieu, giving it far greater publicity and significance than it would have otherwise enjoyed. Although Hulesim's brilliant career was cut short by a scandal, which implicated him in a massive cover-up to protect a powerful friend accused of rape, leading to the commissioner's suicide in 1900, Hulesim's legacy survived his premature death. The investigative techniques he introduced, and more significantly for our interests, his attitude towards Berlin's sexual minorities played a tremendous role in establishing a modern homosexual identity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, You've heard um, two sections from the first two chapters of the book. And just to give you um, a short overview um, of the book, um, in the first chapter, Robert discusses, as you've heard, the life of Karl Heinrich. Ulrich traces back his life and works. And in the second chapter, deals with the sometimes paradoxical um, relation between Berlin police and homosexual culture and nightlife and then Robert goes on to discuss various social, um, economical, um, political and cultural developments um, that form the picture of, um, there is a quotation by Klaus Mann that Robert quotes in the beginning, I wouldn't have known it, um, that form the picture of Berlin as a department store of assorted vices. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a quotation by Klaus Mann. And um, 
Robert um, deals with the efforts of Magnus Hirschfeld, we're going to talk about him later, and um, the uh, foundation of the um, Scientific Humanitarian Committee and later on the Institute of Sexual Science. He deals with the various um, factions of um, uh, homosexual uh, theoretical thinking by men like um, Hans Blüher, Friedrich Ratzuwald, Adolf Brandt, very um, different approaches to homosexuality, actually, uh, with the um, connection between the military and homosexual, best exemplified in the so-called Eulenburg scandal or the Eulenburg Harden um, affair, and of course with the role of the media um, with different or various um, stage plays, theater, films, um, books and public performances, and ending with the destruction of the Institute for Sexual Science in May 1933, uh, months or just weeks after the Nazis took power. In fact, it was one of the first measures um, by the Nazis. But um, let's return to that first um, scene you just read, um, the um, speech by Karl Heinrich Ulrichs at the Odeon in Munich before the Association of German Jurists. Could you once again say what was the truly new and innovative aspect of that speech, aside from the fact that he publicly came out of the closet? Well, I wouldn't understate the significance of his um, public coming out. I mean, I think uh, the attempt to begin to create a kind of visibility was maybe um, the most important first step or initial step, and, and certainly an incredibly brave one. So there was no visibility. Um, there was no definition of a sexual minority. And in that respect, it's incredibly significant. I think the speech also brought a lot of attention to his pamphlet publications, which he continued to produce. So there were, I think, a total of 12 mm -hmm. in the course of about 15 years. Um, they continued into the 1870s. And it brought him a, a degree of notoriety um, that also um, drew attention to the pamphlets themselves. And these pamphlets were joked about by many people, and um, even Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels had mm -hmm. um, uh, a correspondence about them at one point. Um, and a lot of people had trouble taking him at all seriously, but he was ultimately cited by medical doctors and psychiatrists who were addressing the, the same question and issue, and repeatedly through the 19th into the 20th century. So he clearly had uh, an important um, influence. And so I, I think his ability to begin to claim that there was some kind of innate um, uh, character to um, people, same-sex loving people, and to also suggest that there was actually um, a broader community of these people. They simply didn't realize um, that it existed. I think, I think that was, that was um, a big part of his um, significance, in addition to being just an incredibly brave activist. That is the beginning of, of chapter one, but it's not the very beginning of the book, because mm -hmm. there's, an, there's a prologue. Um, and um, maybe that's a very German thing to ask. Um, you know, when we start re or when I started reading the book, to me in the beginning everything is doomed to failure in a way. We know why your book ends in 1933, even before we start reading the first sentence. Uh, we know what happens in the end. And so I thought you, you could have begun um, with the um, destruction <laughs> of the Institute for Sexual Science. That, that could have been, well, it would be a, a cliched beginning in a way to start with the with the ending, but you could have um, begun with that. You do not. You do not start with that. You do not start with the Nazis. You do not start with politics or with science, but you start with the rather um, vivid description of a literally a walk through daytime and nighttime Berlin, encapsulated in two and a half pages. I think a walk that W. H. Auden and Christopher Isherwood took in the late 1920s, I guess. Um, and you um, describe, um, well, very flamboyant characters they meet on their way. Um, how did you come up with that, um, with that beginning of the book, with that beginning of the, uh, of the prologue? And perhaps you can retell uh, 
um, the story of, of the encounter between W.H. Auden and the woman on the um, bus or tram? Well, when I started this project, I guess one of uh, the big questions is in my mind was where this curious word "fool" came from, mm -hmm. and I um, also wondered whether or not it had been used very often, um, say before the 1970s. And um, there are actually a lot of um, really fantastic um, um, Berlin historians who've documented many elements of what, what I write about in this book. And um, it seems pretty clear that um, the word schwul is somehow related to schwul. And um, that seems to have some relationship to this um, idea or this, this expression, warm brother, or Varma Buddha. So that's, that's at least one theory. But what really astonished me, I was looking at a short diary that W.H. Auden kept about the time he spent in Berlin. He was writing it as he was living here. And at one point, as you um, alluded to, he describes um, a scene where a woman approaches him and he thinks she's flirting with him on a tram. And in his mind, he rehearses what he would say to her if he only could. And that was, um, uh, you're flirting with the wrong guy. Ich bin schwul. Um, and when I, when I first read that, it jumped out at me because I'd been looking for this word everywhere. And I never expected to find, um, well, an English poet, um, or an Englishman. He was barely a poet yet at this point, I guess. Mm -hmm. But someone who really didn't speak German very well and hadn't learned very much German, um, he did know this expression. <laughs> and so, so I guess um, that was the real inspiration for um, starting to talk about Christopher Isherwood and Auden in this particular context. And what became clear as I learned more about the two of them and more about England in the 1920s was that um, Berlin was a, a kind of vehicle um, for um, the growth of a certain self-awareness. And you know, it was really in Berlin where they um, came to understand who they were as, as, as I guess, as uh, sexual beings. And, and so I, I, think, I think that's the inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed to me to really sort of showcase um, Berlin mm -hmm. and um, sort does. of tie the idea that Berlin is also, well, the birthplace of mm -hmm. this modern identity. So. And it, in a way, encapsulates all the different as the various aspects that you cover in your book. Um, the um, you write that the under uh, I wrote it down the underappreciated factor in the history of gay Berlin um, is um, has has to do with the role of this Berlin police commissioner with the um, wonderful German name Leopold von Mierscheid, Hulism. <laughs> um, and you talked about him, but. Um, you wouldn't naturally think of a police commissioner to play a crucial um, or a significant part in this story, um, a bit of a positive one. Um, so could you elaborate a little bit on, on what a Meerschatulism did do and to what effect? Well, simply deciding that it was easier or more practical to tolerate public accommodations that appealed to same-sex loving people um, than to try to close them down. Um, that had the obvious effect of allowing this milieu to develop and sort of become increasingly entrenched. And so, and what this meant, practically speaking, was that um, men and women could seek out the company, um, the sociability of other like-minded men and women without fear of arrest. And this this was this was a significant issue. Um, uh, so it it made it possible to actually. Um, have something like um, a gay life um, and a certain sort of social life. So in that respect, it's just absolutely um, central. I mean, this, this policy that he introduced and that was then followed even after his death in 1900. Um, but the other thing that's even uh, much more improbable, I think, is the way he also, as I think just read or described a little bit ago, turned Berlin into a laboratory of sexuality. And, he, and there are numerous accounts, um, I gave you a few of them in my reading, uh, from the 1890s and then beyond, where um, first Hulesum and then um, his successors, and also Magnus Hirschfeld and some of the other sexologists actually 
provided tours um, for people who were visiting or people who wanted to study um, what was going on in the city, or um, sometimes just curiosity seekers. Mm -hmm. So, and this, this really gave Berlin a certain reputation. And it also allowed, if you will, um, medical professionals, psychiatrists, sexologists, to study this <coughs> queer folk in situ, I mean, which, which mm -hmm. was something that wasn't possible practically anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So and in that regard, I think, I think um, this policy was really uh, influential, and, and, and in so many ways, um, its effect was counterintuitive and un unanticipated. So. You just mentioned another very, of course, prominent figure in your book, and we have to talk about him, and most of you will know a lot about Magnus Hirschfeld, <clears throat> who is sort of the um, hero of, of this book, in a way. Um, a German-Jewish doctor born in Kolberg and um, the founder of the first homosexual rights movement, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee. Um, how would you describe the impact of, uh, of Hirschfeld? What were his main achievements and challenges? That's a tall order, <laughs> I'd say, <laughs> because he, he really was important, and I think he was really influential. And I should also uh, preface any, any of my comments by saying that I think there are lots of people, um, maybe in this audience as well, who know um, a great deal about Hirschfeld and, and probably more than I do. <laughs> so there's, there's a Magnus Hirschfeld um, Gesellschaft that was founded in the early uh, 1980s, uh, still exists, and um, the members have done amazing um, uh, recovery and work, and they've created um, a small library and archive. And there's also, of course, the Schwules Museum um, here in Berlin, which is also a fantastic and amazing institution. So, um, but if I would highlight just a, a couple of Hirschfeld's um, really, really important contributions, and maybe ones that um, have gone to some extent unrecognized, I, I would, I would focus on this interesting theoretical distinction that he made um, starting with his publication, The Transvestites, to Transvestiten in 1910, between sexual orientation on the one hand mm -hmm. and gender identity on the other. And when he published this work um, in 1910, Die Transvestiten, he actually coined this word transvestite to describe cross-dressers. Um, and this was the first time that it appeared in print. So, and I, I think it's fair to say that he invented the word as well. Um, but some of the things he claimed in this work um, included um, observations that, for example, um, not all male cross-dressers were homosexual. Um, many of them were heterosexual. Um, and he claimed that the same was true about um, women who wore men's clothing. Um, so, the association had always been between cross-dressing and same-sex orientation, um, homosexuality. And so he, he was the first, I think, at least in a significant publication, to claim that this was a false representation, this was a misperception. And he continued this kind of work um, through the 1920s until he left Berlin. And he never came up really with the same sort of language that we have at the beginning of the 21st century to describe distinctions between same-sex orientation, sexual orientation, and gender identity. But he was really the first to begin to recognize that there were individuals um, for whom sexual orientation wasn't <coughs> exactly the issue. It was um, this feeling of being born in the wrong body trapped in the wrong body. And one of the really interesting ways in which he pursued this then was to also support um, different sorts of therapies and treatments at the um, Institute for Sexual Research that he founded uh, right after, actually just before the end of the First World War, where um, there were experiments with primitive hormone therapy and also the very first um, sexual reassignment surgeries, um, which were not tremendously successful, um, but um, this really started um, a science of transsexuality that also had um, important influences on what came after 
the Second World War. So um, one of his, I think you could almost say protégés, was another Berlin medical doctor named Harry Benjamin. And uh, Benjamin actually left Berlin um, before the First World War, but he was introduced to sexology by Hirschfeld. He was given one of these tours um, uh, already before 1910. And after 1945, in the US, he was responsible for pioneering um, this science of transsexualism. And so he also created the first uh, protocol for individuals who wanted to transition from one sex to the other. So, but again, if I, if I can just um, sort of recap what I think is really significant here is the way in which Hirschfeld was able to begin to sort of um, see a difference between orientation on the one hand and gender identity on the other. And I think, I think um, this is something that people are just beginning to sort of um, um, appreciate and understand. And, and he, was really, he was really the absolute pioneer in that regard. The Institute for Sexual Science was the first um, such facility in the world. And um, you write, um, becoming a popular tourist destination, um, the Institute was one of the singular institutions that helped to define Weimar Berlin. Why was that? Well, the way it became a tourist destination had to do maybe with the fact that it was much more than just some sort of research institute. Um, uh, it was, in many respects, a very, very important research institute. And it, it garnered the attention of medical doctors and sexologists from, from all over Europe and, and North America. Um, so that's significant. Um, but there was always this element um, with Hirschfeld, and I think also with the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, of attempting to um, inform a public and um, sort of educate a public about sexual orientation and I'd argue eventually also about gender identity. Mm -hmm. And so there were features of the um, Institute for Sexual um, Science um, that were geared really just to public education, um, including um, a kind of museum um, with lots of um, interesting displays and um, Hirschfeld's international dildo collection, um, uh, you know, things, things that um, weren't, strictly speaking, scientific, but um, uh, <laughs> certainly <laughs> held tremendous interest, at least for certain people. Mm -hmm. so, so I think um, it was, in large part, Hirschfeld's own ability to popularize his science and, and sort of draw people in who weren't necessarily interested only in the kind of um, science, quote unquote science, that sexologists at this point were pursuing. So I, I think that played a big role. Mm -hmm. OK, at this point, I'd like to um, um, open up the talk now and invite you to um, ask your questions to um, Robert. We've got a microphone over there, or two such devices. I don't know. No, one microphone. So any questions from you? Good evening. Uh, my question is kind of uh, pretty short. Uh, why Berlin? Especially if you compare uh, the sexual life in other big cities of the late 19th century, let's say like, like London, or especially Paris. Paris, which was famous for its brothels, which had a huge commercial uh, sexual market uh, from the uh, brothels for the uh, 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 cheap laborers for the, uh, um, up to the um, um, highest levels of society or the figures of the cohort who could uh, rise from uh, uh, very low levels up, uh, up to, be, uh, to become a star of, of society. And they also had like gay brothels. And they had, uh, in France there was a tradition of not um, stigmatizing gay sex. So uh, the question is, why is it Berlin that kind of like invented the whole uh, um, thing about gay sex and about schwul and not Paris? I've worked on this project um, with a kind of comparative framework in mind, even though I don't describe or discuss um, other major cities in any great detail. I think the easiest answer to your question is that the French 
abolished their anti-sodomy statute or simply took it out of their criminal code. Um, first um, in 1791, and then that was confirmed with the Napoleonic Code in 1810. Um, so the absence of a law meant that there wasn't something that needed to be studied. Yeah. It didn't matter. No one was breaking a law. Um, and it also meant that there was nothing to protest against. So there wasn't the same um, impulse for some sort of activism. And it's, it's really both the study and the activism together. That's, that's really the core, I think, of, of my argument um, that promotes or is responsible for creating, for inventing homosexuality. And um, I think that's my answer. Hi. Um, uh, just to continue on that theme, wouldn't you think there's something um, in particular in, in relation to Prussia that also has something to do with this? Um, Prussia is in many ways a paradox, and certainly um, it, there bears strong contrast. For example, its policy of social tolerance in the late 17th, early, uh, I'm sorry, late 18th, early 19th century, but also um, its incredible uh, conservatism and rigid social hierarchies. Do you think that there's something innate in Prussia itself um, that may have resulted in, in, in that as well? That obviously ties to the penal code as well, but is there something in, in part of the greater cultural, social, and historical tradition? Well, there's certainly, uh, the, there's certainly a connection um, between a military culture and um, homosociality. Um, and I think ultimately there's often a homoerotic element to a lot of military cultures. Um, so I guess if I were going to single out um, a feature of Prussian history that's maybe significant in this regard, it would be, it would be um, uh, this emphasis on, um, or maybe what we could describe, what historians might describe as this militarism um, reaching all the way back even to the 17th century, further back than just Friedrich the Great. So, um, um, I think I think that's probably maybe the most significant element of Prussian culture that, that contributes to this. Mm -hmm. Any further questions here in the front? Um, hi, thanks. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the role of capitalism in the emergence of this identity. Um, and well, because I'm thinking about, I mean, homosexuality, the, the practice itself has always existed, but the identity and the label is a certain moment in history. So scholars in the United States have linked it to capitalism. I'm wondering if you could take that kind of analysis and apply it to Berlin. Hmm. <laughs> well, and also the, the, the person who spoke beforehand mentioned migrant labors. Sure. Right? And, Sure. And leaders coming together and working together, mm -hmm. giving a kind of milieu mm -hmm. in situ kind of um, sure. situation that we've been talking about. Well, I think, I think um, German industrialization um, plays a role in as much as it contributes to the growth of the capital city. Um, so um, urbanization itself is, is really significant mm -hmm. through the 19th century for all kinds of um, subcultures. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, certainly, Berlin's almost exponential growth from about 1850 to 1910 is, is really, really important. Um, so um, I'm not sure if that's the exact same thing as capitalism. Um, um, in a later period, uh, I would say that uh, the identity itself is promoted by capitalists, um, uh, certainly through the 1920s, um, especially um, different publishers, um, people who uh, work as um, people who, who own bars or, or different sorts of cafes. Um, so there, there is clearly um, a queer market or a gay market of some description that's, that's already in place no later than the 1920s. So in that regard, um, uh, there, there is an element of capitalism. If um, I, I have a little trouble um, uh, sort of wrapping my brain around the idea that capitalism is a driving force. Um, industrialization takes place in so many different ways in different places at different times. And there does seem to be something unique about the second half of the 19th century um, 
Um, but of course, um, English industrialization is something that's much earlier than what happens in Germany. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the timing. So, but. There was a question first by um, Barbara Finken, and then Thomas Spahr, and then you too. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I didn't know whether you were trying to tell the story of progress and the story of emancipation or the story of liberation, but I think one could as well tell the story of becoming a homosexual identity uh, the way Foucault would tell it. That is, as a story, you know, three types were discovered. The, the hysterical woman, I mean, dispersive types, the hysterical woman, the masturbating child, and the homosexual. And I think that the, the story you're telling might as well be told It's quite a sad story, uh, as a story where identity as a kind of alienation, as a kind of Verdinglichung, uh, Entfremdung, uh, uh, is stamped upon uh, something that in France, for example, uh, from Balzac over Proust to Flaubert, uh, just to quote a few, <laughs> uh, wasn't uh, pressed uh, with this kind of uh, military, sadomaso, uh, police, uh, science, into what you call an identity. And I think I, I really see a problem with to, t to tell this story as a story of progress, emancipation, and success. I'm not sure I'm absolutely arguing that this is a story of um, sure um, emancipation and success. In fact, I'm not. Uh, I mean, my, my point really is that there is um, There is an element of there's a, there's an element of essentialism that defines um, sexual orientation. I, I, I mean, and that's something that people debate, and um, a lot of people would reject that, of course, now. Um, but that's always that's always been part of any sense of sexual identity. And what I'm really talking about is um, the specific context and the 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 time when this essentialism is invented. So, uh, I mean, to the extent that this is a story of, I mean, it is, a, it, it is about um, attempts to reform the law because, because and, and, and I have to tell that story because that's, that's part of the explanation for the invention of the essentialism. But I, I guess um, I, maybe I should almost apologize if this sounds too Whiggish, but and that, that really wasn't my intention exactly. I, I'm also at no point taking an explicit position on essentialism. So um, I'm, my real point here, and maybe 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 it's maybe my narrative style sort of belies this, but my real point is about the invention of essentialism, and mm -hmm. so it's it's about historicizing this moment, and. So I, I don't disagree with Foucault in, in most respects. I just add specificity, uh, which, which is lacking, I think, from his account. Um, just one question. It is quite strange, and you showed that clearly in, in your book that there is the persecution of homosexuality had been the persecution of a behavior, not of a character. So it's much more difficult to find out a character. But that's then a behavior, and uh, there are very silly stories of Karl Kraus, this uh, strange paragraph, uh, which lasted until 69 in Germany. But I'm still asking, isn't it rather an invention of homosexual, of a homosexual character instead of homosexuality? Then, because it, in the 1930s and 40s, Medicines discovered the behavior, and they looked for the homosexual behavior, and suddenly they discovered or they constructed a, a character. But that had been a, some years earlier than your invention. So I'm just asking you: you, you, I, you don't think that it's necessary to make a differentiation between homosexuality and homosexuals? One more time. You don't. You don't think. You don't think it makes sense to differentiate between homosexuality and you. You. You are showing very clearly in your book that the persecution was based on behavior, mm -hmm. not on a character. The but, law. But right. you are showing characters in your book. 
So you don't think that it's necessary. You, you, your book is called The Invention of Homosexuality in, in Modern Berlin. But isn't it rather the invention of homosexuals as a character, also a self-explanation of characters? Mm. That's my question. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I mean, that sounds, that sounds like semantics to me. I'm not sure if I... <laughs> um, um. You know, so the character, it is, the, 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 I think it's very difficult to, to discover a behavior, and there had been a huge efforts, especially in France and also in Austria in the 19th century, to describe the behavior and the marks of homosexuality as a person. And suddenly they were looking for behaviors, and it came out a character. But we have to make that the homosexuality existed forever. I mean, this is not an oh, invention. Oh, I see. But the homosexual oh. as a character, I would say, and then I would oh, I date him yeah. earlier. Okay. Oh, okay. You know, that's, it's only oh, okay. it, it, it's a question of right. Of well, date. yeah. Uh, I guess um, I'm I'm relying in part on uh, Foucault's argument from um, the first volume of his series on the history of sexuality. An introduction where he says that with the invention of the word, we have for the first time a new species. And one of the things that, of course, inspired me was to focus on the fact that the first time the word was used was in a German language pamphlet um, protesting the, the Prussian anti sodomy statute. So um, I would say. I mean, the way I'm using the word homosexuality, I'm, I'm using it um, as um, a category of not behavior. I, I am talking not about, I am talking about character when I use the word homosexuality. Um, and I wouldn't use the word homosexuality to describe behaviors. Um, I, I would use the other uh, sort of historic language that's used to describe these behaviors, sodomy, um, Maybe pederasty, buggery. I mean, there you know there there are a whole there are a whole there's there's a huge vocabulary for that. So so I guess um, um, I, I don't I don't quite agree. If, I mean, if you're arguing that homosexuality has always existed, well, the point the point of the book is that well, no, it hasn't really, at least not as an identity. And so I'm I mean, I I would distinguish between homosexuality and sodomite or homosexual and sodomite, but I wouldn't distinguish between homosexuality and homosexual, which is, which is I think, the distinction you're asking me to make. So I, I'm not sure if that answers the question. But. There were two questions in the second um, row here, one over there and one over there. I, I'd like to go back to the comparative question, which was asked at the very beginning. Um, I think the second question. Uh, the, the fact that you as a German historian should decide to write a book on gay Berlin is, I think, a perfectly natural choice, and I don't think you have to defend that in a sense. But since you self-consciously chose to tie a title which repeats the title of an earlier book called Gay New York, I, uh, I wonder if you might want to comment. First, I have a two-part question. First part is comment on what uh, differences there really were or similarities uh, between Berlin and New York, just one or two specific ones. Um, and then I'd like to go back to the, keeps coming up, the French example. Because since you decided as one of your two passages to read at the beginning, to bring up this passage about how the absence of police repression encouraged the creation of a community of homosexuals in, Ber in Berlin, uh, why is that pioneering when the absence of oppressive community in France already existed? Well. The comparison between gay Berlin and gay New York um, is, I think, really important. And it's, not a, it's, it's, it's a contrast, actually. I mean, so uh, George Chauncey's argument in gay New York is that there really wasn't any kind of essentialism, um, uh, or at least um, there wasn't the notion of same-sex orientation, per se. Um, what was significant was gender identity. And so it didn't, it didn't matter who you did. It mattered that you were doing, if you can follow that. So, um, um, and this meant that men 
who had sex with other men, as long as they um, remained uh, masculine in their role, in their sexual role, they never jeopardized their masculinity. And so um, the real issue then, um, I think, as George Chauncey argues, and this, this, is, this is a pretty sort of broad generalization, but I think, I think if he were sitting here, he'd agree with me. Um, the real issue is one of gender identity and, and your, your sort of place in the sexual act or your role in the sexual act. And so, um, and that doesn't shift, as he argues, until sometime after um, maybe 1940 <laughs> or you know, maybe after the Second World War in New York, in the US. And so up until that point, you have, you have a completely different set of categories. And it's not about sexual orientation. <coughs> um, there isn't a sense of essentialism. It's really about um, gender identity. Are you a man? Are you a woman? Um, so, and that's actually, that was a really important point of departure for me because I, I the more I learned about, I mean, it, it, was, it was a sharp contrast to Foucault's argument. Um, and it also seemed to, um, it didn't seem to conform to what I thought, or it, it contradicted what I thought was going on maybe in Berlin. So, and I, I was convinced by the time I published the book that I was right about Berlin anyway. So, <laughs> so, um, um, so that I, that, that's, that's the distinction, I think, between New York and Berlin. And, and there, there are lots of explanations, I think. I, I don't think, I don't think um, gay New York is wrong. I, I just think it's, it's different. Um, so, um, uh, and then the second question, I, I guess I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to argue that, um, I mean, I try to qualify this you know, Berlin policing policy by um, uh, describing it as um, s you know, self-interested, pragmatic. <laughs> so it's not exactly progressive. It's, I, I mean, on some level it's progressive, maybe. But I mean, what's, it's, really, it's really about surveillance and control. And, and that's, that's, that's the real motivation for, for um, Mershet Hulesum. And uh, for his successors, and that's where the, that's where the policy actually comes from. So, um, the reason it's significant is because of the way it entrenches um, this notion of an essentialist identity. Um, it allows it, it allows for the growth of this milieu. So, um, and I think there's ample evidence for that. I mean, um, at least from the book, maybe not from what I read to you. <laughs> but um, there are lots of ways in which um, different observers and, and individuals um, describe how um, the simple fact that people are allowed to congregate despite this law and socialize and sort of enjoy um, each other's company in these public accommodations that are catering clearly, you know, exclusively to same-sex loving men and women, um, that is really, really important for um, the development of an idea of identity. And so, and so I, that's, that's not necessarily a progressive thing. Um, uh, I, I don't mean to depict it that way exactly. I just, I just, I just mean to sort of highlight it as a, as a really important um, dynamic or, or policy in this case that's, that, that plays a huge role in this story. So it's, it's just one of the features of Berlin that make Berlin mm -hmm. different, maybe, or. Um, my question follows, I think, well, in the past several questions, um, I work on classical antiquity, where the, the issues are, work more in the, in the kind of New York way of, of, mm -hmm. of, of doing right. things. And the, the, the issue of, of sexual identity, if one let's get rid of identity of sexual practices mm -hmm. was more defined in terms of, of whether one particularly as a man was penetrating or penetrated uh, but if you were penetrating there was there was indifference to your sexual object so I'm wondering you know if if in this invention of this category of homosexuality the idea of bisexuality is either invented or somehow elided it's, I mean, is no. bisexuality at all a category within these, you know, it something is. that it these, is. these sexologists you know, it, it is. It is, absolutely. And, and, and the word is also then used, um, actually, um, in another publication by um, the same man who publishes the anonymous 
who publishes the pamphlets anonymously that introduce the word homosexuality. So, so bisexuality is, is also a category, and it, it emerges also in the literature and the language of the sexologists. So um, no, it's not, it's not alighted. So, but is it an identity? Or how does it play in the it's, Um, well, probably the bisexuals of Imperial Berlin um, suffered the same invisibility that bisexuals suffer today. <laughs> I mean, sorry, that was that was blip. Um, I, I mean, I, there there wouldn't have been the same sort of um, milieu. There wouldn't have been there wouldn't have been the same uh, subculture uh, entrenched in the same way. Um, um, but certainly, it was a category, and um, I, I would imagine there were people who, who um, sort of embraced it. Um, I, um, there weren't there weren't you know bars or you know there weren't establishments that were um, you know designated for bisexuals exactly or understood to cater to bisexuals. <laughs> um, there there is there is another sort of um, identity, um, which we might attach. The label bisexuality to, and that's that's the um, sort of uh, counter um, point to Hirschfeld's essentialism, and and that's that's the that's the um, identity of the masculinists, um, and and this is the group that um, emerged already at the very beginning of the nineteenth century, um, and they were responding in part to the Scientific Humanitarian Committee in Hirschfeld, and. Um, these were people like Adolf Brandt and Benedict Friedländer and uh, also eventually Hans Bluer who um, actually looked to this Greek model and in a, a lot of cases um, they also um, married themselves. Sometimes they even had children and families but then they also um, very often had male lovers and um, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have liked the label bisexual um, because that was a that was a a label that came from um, the sexologists, including Hirschfeld. Um, so, um, but certainly bisexuality was also a part of this discourse um, um, by the end of the 19th century. So they had no label, these people who did this? They went under, I mean, they're just. No, no, they, well, no, they, they had, uh, they, they called themselves masculinists, and they, <laughs> Initially, they really defined themselves against the Scientific Humanitarian Committee and against Hirschfeld. So, um, and they, I mean, they were generally right wing. I mean, they they were they they were often ultra nationalists. They were they were misogynists. They were they were um, usually anti Semitic. Um, certainly by the nineteen twenties. Um, so, uh, but they they disliked they. I mean, if you, um, if you, th this, 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 uh, Cedric Kosofsky, and um, she, of course, um, sort of traces this to the division between um, Hirschfeld, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, and Adolf Brandt um, at the beginning of. So for the masculinists, um, most, most men um, are probably, uh, for want of a better word, bisexual. They wouldn't have used the word, but um, um, uh, um, they would have expected um, to see this, um, if, if there weren't repression or if there weren't laws, they would have um, expected to see um, uh, most men attracted to both men and women. So, um, just a second. By the way, if you want to ask your questions in German, it's possible because um, Robert knows German very well, and we will then try to um, translate the question. But here's another one from the second. Yes, I was actually very much struck by something that came up in in your first reading about these many people who committed suicide because they were frightened, not just of persecution, but also of disgrace. And that reminded me that there really are two different kinds of things that are going on here that act on, on people who have deviant sexual relations. Because not only 
the tyranny of the law, mm -hmm. but there's also what Mill calls the tyranny of public opinion. Mm -hmm. And so even though you, your police inspector, the nice police inspector, has made these places where people can meet, I wondered how it came about that the people you know, who might, if they'd been prosecuted, um, then have felt socially disgraced enough to uh, take their own lives, were prepared to go along there. Was there something important besides what you told us about Berlin that not only enabled uh, these places to operate legally, but also for the men and women who went to them to feel that they weren't in danger of some kind of public condemnation or shaming by their friends? Um, that might be a clue to some of these comparative things as well. Uh, I don't know about that. Hmm. But, um, hmm. but I'd like to ask you to say a little bit more about how an attitude of toleration grew up sufficiently to sort of overcome what seemed at the beginning of your story to have been a real feeling that this was a kind of, um, of offense that <coughs> gave such offense that you had no further place in society. Well, I think there were lots of different kinds of motivation for suicide. And um, in some cases, it might have been, I think, what you're describing as social shaming or the shame attached to um, being known to be a sodomite or uh, uh, the shame attached to having been prosecuted under paragraph 175. Um, there, are other, there are other sorts of examples where individuals are, are maybe blackmailed. And um, in some cases, the suicide actually stems from the fact that they've been ruined financially. Um, so, so I guess they're, they're, different, they're different exact reasons, I think, for, um, for suicide. And it's not always maybe just social shaming. Um, um, Think of somebody like Thomas Mann. Mm -hmm. Thomas Mann mm -hmm. uh, would probably have been delighted that the, the law was off, but he would have he would have definitely <coughs> hesitated, unlike Klaus, to go mm. to the to go to the club. And I wonder how they, these places became acceptable for men and women to go. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure they ever became acceptable exactly. I mean, I, that's not that's not that's not really um, necessarily part of the story. Um, what, what's important is that one could go to one of these venues and not fear um, being arrested simply for being there. Um, so that's, that's the real point. Uh, it doesn't mean that people would announce that this is what they did in their free time. <laughs> um, and I, I don't, I mean, I guess there, there are different sorts of visibility. Um, I don't think there would have been um, a lot of comfort um, before 1914 in sort of revealing that you um, are a same-sex loving man or woman. Um, that's not something very many people would have felt comfortable disclosing. Um, it might have been different by the 1920s for people like Klaus Mann. So, um, I'm not sure either that a comparison, say, between Berlin and Paris or Berlin and London would show us anything different than this. So um, I accept that um, there isn't the same sort of identity um, maybe in Paris. Um, but I'm not sure that there would have been any less stigma attached to being found out um, to be a sodomite in Paris than, say, in Berlin or in London. So I, um, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question very well or not. Um, but um, I, I guess my focus has really been on um, the law, reactions to the law, and uh, the way in which spaces permit or permitted individuals to form and forge community. And, and that, that community is the, is the source of identity, I think. So.
We've got time for one or perhaps two more short questions. Yes, over there. Hello. Could you speak a little bit about the present, uh, since you're a cultural historian? Um, you talked about essentialism, and now we're seeing, particularly on college campuses, a lot of, quote, fluidity. So that flies in the face of uh, innate nature, orientation, and um, hard wiring. So what do you make of this? Well, I don't know. I'm talking about a modern, not a postmodern identity. Maybe that's. <laughs> I don't know. Um, what do I make of it? I, I don't. I don't. Again, I, I'm not. I'm not an advocate here. Exactly. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not arguing for essentialism. I, I'm. I'm just historicizing it. I guess. So. So. Um, I, I, I taught at a liberal arts college uh, for ten years before I moved to Korea about a year ago, and um, I was. Um, the faculty sponsor of the LGBTQ Student <laughs> Association, and I can't even give you all the other letters that are attached to that, you know. And so, um, so there's this. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's just this proliferation of. Are they identities? I'm not sure. Um, you know, they're anti identities. A lot of them. So, um, gender queer. I mean, everything, everything imaginable, and. Um, I think that's great, um, and I don't. I don't think there's anything exactly special about essentialism. I, I think. I think you know there 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 are times and places where it's um, maybe politically um, expedient, and that's certainly how Hirschfeld viewed it. I mean, so uh, you know his his own his own model to a large extent was. Um, uh, Jewish emancipation in you know in the 19th century in Germany, and so and now freedom to marry if it's yeah if it's not a choice so now is it a choice I mean so how did this how did this evolve from from the roots in Berlin to today right. oh hmm. Well, you need some essentialism to start with, don't you? I mean, if you're going to react to it. I, I don't know. Um, uh. <laughs> Big question at the end. Yeah. Is there another short uh, question <laughs> or a question <laughs> which is possible to answer in a few minutes? Uh, in the back. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I noticed uh, you were always saying same-sex loving men and, and women. So I was wondering if that was really true, if that was also happening, or was it just men fighting for men and then the women sort of tagged along in the shadows? How, how did it work? Did you get it? Yeah. Uh, so did the so, difference, um, if. If there, if there were actually women involved in this um, exactly. story that I... Visibly. That I'm I mean, but, oh, you've all, uh, 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 about names of men <laughs> fighting for men's rights, and you always said, said the club of men and women. And women, yeah, mm -hmm. right, I know. Um, it, yeah, it sounds like an afterthought. And um, first of all, the book is limited, and um, so I, I don't um, write very much at all about women and... Um, I don't, I know something about that story too. Um, there's another book that was just published a few months before mine um, that deals with exactly that question and the same time frame by a great American historian named Marty Liebeck. <laughs> so, and I can re recommend it. Um, in terms of the invention of this essentialism, it is applied equally to same sex loving women. Um, um, certainly by the sexologists. The sexologists, though, as you point out, are all men, or mostly men. And um, there's also this peculiarity in Germany um, that the law never criminalizes, even under the Nazis, um, um, sex acts between women. And so, <laughs> again, this, this um, means that 
there aren't the same sorts of implications or repercussions, and that 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 in my argument changes changes in a lot of ways um, the effect, I guess. So um, I'd like to thank you all for participating in this um, discussion and asking your questions. Um, Robert will read another passage from um, the book at the ending. Um, but before that, I'd uh, like to thank the American Academy for having us and organizing the event, um, the Siedler Verlag for publishing the book, and, um, and you all for coming um, tonight and being a part of this event. And of course, thank you very much to you, Robert, for coming to Berlin and for writing the book in the first place. And um, I wish you all a very nice evening and a peaceful way back home. Thank you. Now it's here. Okay. And of course, you're invited to have a glass of wine with us. But now Robert uh, reads um, a last passage from the book. This is very short, a single paragraph. So the very last paragraph. So. We're on time. Yeah. Are we? OK, that's good. <laughs> Germans are still in the process of recovering their own history. This task is complicated tremendously by the catastrophic destruction of the Nazi era, which abolished institutions, disrupted and scattered networks of friends and activists, and eliminated countless sources. Even those who remained and survived dictatorship and war were compelled to destroy everything, letters, journals, photo albums, that might incriminate them as homosexual. The supreme irony, perhaps, is that the gay pride parades held every summer since the 1970s in Berlin and other major German cities are referred to colloquially as CSD, say S Day, or Christopher Street Day, an allusion to the 1969 riots at the Stonewall Inn, the putative birthplace of the modern homosexual rights movement. Thank you.